all of us are concerned about our future. What will we do as we grow older, as we mature more? What will our profession be? What will we do in our spare time? Will we be healthy? Will we achieve all of our goals, be as impactful and as, as, as influencing as we'd like to be? Well, with me today is Dr. Ken Deitwald. He's the president and CEO of Age Wave. He is an author. He's a psychologist. He is a man who is sought across America and the world by leaders and organizations alike to understand from his own research, empirical data, research that tells the story in language we can all understand. So for the next hour, get ready to listen to and learn from a really smart guy who knows his stuff. Dr. Deitwald, welcome. Great to be with Great you. Great to have you with us. Great to be with you. So I'm really curious, what got you going down this path in the first place? What interested you in this subject? Well, I have to say first that it's changed over the years. But when I was a young man, I was 23, and I was working on my doctorate on the psychology of the body, and actually writing my very first book, a book called Body Mind, which I'm happy to say is still in print, you know, 40-something years later. But um, I was asked by the National Institutes on Health to set up the first preventative health research project with older adults. And I was just a kid, and I thought, well, this would be kind of interesting to work with older men and women to help them improve their health and teach them yoga and improve their diets and, and see what kinds of holistic therapies would have the most effect on them. But the truth of it is, is that I became really fascinated by the older people. Uh, I thought, why is it to see life from a 90-year-old? point of view. What is it to imagine the possibilities when you're 60? What is it to think of family, not when you're 30, but when you're 75? And I became incredibly curious about what life was like for long-lived people. But then it turned again. A few years later, this project called the SAGE Project became very successful. And I was asked to speak all over the world, and I wrote a few more books about all of this. And before I knew it, I was beginning to realize that the entire world was growing older that we've historically been a young world. You know, for 99% of human history, the average life expectancy was under 18. I know that's crazy to imagine, but you know, there were 40 and 60 year olds in the past, but not very many. Today, most of us will live very long lives. In fact, two thirds of all the people who have ever lived past 65 in the entire history of the world are alive today. So what I began to envision was how were markets going to change? How are our families going to shift? Uh, when are we old? Uh, maybe there's time for a second career, a comeback. Maybe we re can reinvent ourselves at 70 or 90. And I've spent these last decades uh, working with companies and governments and doing research all over the world to try to figure out what is the future going to be like as more and more of us live very long mm -hmm. lives. You know, I've read many of your books, of course, heard you speak on a number of occasions. I would characterize you as an expert in the field who gives us all hope that our tomorrows could indeed be better than our yesterdays. Where does that hope come from? Do you, is it based on statistical discoveries? Is it based on your own optimism? What basis is it that gives you this hope? You know, I've gotten to meet many of the world's great futurists and, and at the risk of giving an inside secret, I think most people project the future based on how they're feeling about their own life. Mm -hmm. And um, I've always been a hopeful guy. I've always believed that uh, there were great things that all of us were capable of. I've always believed that there was destiny for all of us. And so when I entered the aging field, so many folks were kind of hand-wringers. Oh, this is terrible, growing old, terrible, terrible. Mm -hmm. And I thought, wait a minute, we've been dreaming throughout all of history of living a long life. You know, our great-great-grandparents, uh, you know, 50 or 60 years was considered a long life. We're going to be the first humans in history to have this extraordinary experience of a 60 or 80 or even 100-year life. And by the way, you know, some of our children are going to live to be 150 with the kind of breakthroughs that are around the corner. So I think that I've infused my own sense of possibilities and my own ideas about what we could all become. But I'll, I'll tell you one ex a story that happened to me as a young man. When I was in my 20s, one of my books uh, uh, did well in Denmark. Mm -hmm. And I was asked to come in and meet with the lead physician in Denmark, who was an 86-year-old woman named Esther Mueller. I remember it very distinctly. It was a long time ago. And I didn't quite know what I was doing. I was a kid, and she was this beautiful elder woman. 
And at the end of a charming, pleasant lunch, she said to me, Ken, how will you use your life? Mm. And at first I thought, I mean, is she asking, what's my career going to be? Or am I going to make money? Or, and, and I pushed back. I said, do you mean what am I going to do for a living? She says, no, how will you use your life? We're all given our lives to give back to society. That through the things we learn, through the things we are, and the long life that you might live, how will you use that life for the betterment of humanity? And I have to tell you that it's taken all these years to really understand Dr. Mueller's question. Mm -hmm. And I think as we live a long life, we all can stop and think, um, who could I become? What's my legacy? What is my purpose at this stage in life? And I'm very chagrined by the fact that last year the average retiree uh, watched 49 hours of television a week. So I don't think we've got the right model in place for who we can become as we grow older. Mm. You know, we tell our students at High Point University that two of the most important words in the English language uh, are the words influence and impact. To influence other people in all the gatherings where you are, to impact society and the world, make it a better place. And again, is America ready for all of this? I mean, if we, if we live to 100 and 110, 120, uh, the implication is they're going to be... Uh, uh, resources needed to make that happen. It's, it's, it, it demands emotional responsiveness on our part, psychological investment. Um, are we as a nation ready for such longevity? Is the system, and I use that word universally, is the system uh, able to withstand such longevity? No. <laughs> uh, I, you know, we're not ready. We've been... Um, We've been very youth-focused during the 20th century and the early years of the 21st century. And our political system is in kind of gridlock, and people are battling for their share of the pie. And um, the way it looks to me is that, first of all, this age wave, this longevity, is a triumph. It's not a tragedy. It's a triumph. Mm. But it's got some thorny issues to be worked through. And, and I think some of the things we could do to be more ready are, are these. First of all, I think we need to do a better job of having our health spans match our lifespans. Unfortunately, we are living long lives, but not as healthy and as able as we could be. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a Greek myth of the beautiful goddess Eos, who falls in love with a warrior named Tithonius. And she asks Zeus if she can get for her lover uh, immortality. He can live forever. And Zeus says, are you sure that's what he wants? Are you sure that's what you want? Mm. And she says, yes. And then as she's leaving Zeus's chamber, she realized she forgot to ask for health. And so as the story goes, this once proud, strapping, handsome warrior grows older and sicker, and his brain, be brain becomes demented, and his organs rot, but he can't die. Mm. We don't want to live long lives if we're debilitated, if we're burdens on our family, if we've lost our dignity. So we need better medicine. We need uh, stronger science to wipe out diseases like Alzheimer's. We need a population of people who take better care of themselves, who are not quite so overweight and who manage their personal health better. And I think we all need to agree that um, we need to put as a priority healthy aging. Second, we're going to have to figure out how to fund these extra years. Mm -hmm. um, and I, this is not a political statement, but if people are going to live longer, we probably need to think about at what age people stop working, at what age people you know, take entitlements that are geared to old age. And um, what are the ways in which people can save more? We don't have a mm -hmm. savings culture. We haven't since World War II. I know my mom and dad grew up in the shadow of the Depression, and, and they were told that they should be very frugal and cautious just in case something happened to the economy. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, my own generation, the boomers, we grew up in a time of great prosperity. And so we've been encouraged to spend every nickel we ever had. That's fine if you're living for today. But if you'd like to live a longer life and enjoy your retirement, some savings and some nest egg is essential. Mm -hmm. So first we need to be healthier. We need to prepare our population and our science and our medical system mm -hmm. for the diseases of the later years. Second, we've got to be a lot smarter about the economics mm -hmm. of aging. But third, and I would have to say uh, just as important, Dr. Cobain, um, is what's the purpose mm -hmm. of living a long life? You know, I, uh, my very last book was called With Purpose. 
And the reason I wrote it was that I'd seen so many books about how to be healthy longer, or how much money do you need if you want to be financially secure, all really important. But nobody was asking the question, kind of what for? Who do you want to be when you're 60? What could you possibly do with your life when you're 75? And what could you learn and how could you reinvent yourself at 90? And I've become incredibly fascinated with these older adults who become volunteers, with older adults who start entrepreneurial businesses, with older adults who learn musical instruments, who go back to college, who fall in love again, who decide they want to be tribal elders in their communities, that I think, unfortunately, in the 20th century, we created a role for older people where we said, OK, you're 65. We don't need you anymore. You just get out of the way. Mm -hmm. I think that was a big mistake. I think we need purpose for our later years. Maybe mm -hmm. what we really need is a kind of an elder core, sort of like a Peace Corps with mm -hmm. 10 million older men and women who are helping to fix America. Mm -hmm. So for me, we have the triumph of long life. But are we ready? No. I think we need to really upgrade our science and practice of medicine. I think we need to do a far better job of managing the economics of longevity. And I think we need to create a new, useful, productive, purposeful purpose to the later years of life. Purpose-driven life of sorts. And yes. Well, um, break this down for us a little bit. Let's talk about an individual. This is a case study. Um, John and, and Susie Doe are 60. 55, 65, pick a number. And they would like to do all that you're talking about. They'd like to see their life go into 100 or 110. They'd like it to be a healthy life. They'd like it to be financially and fiscally stable life. They'd like to have joy and serendipity in their life, uh, a sense of purpose and the belonging, a sense of me. It matters that I live at all. How do we break that down? It's, it's one thing to talk about conceptually. As a nation, we have to have this, this, and this. What does an individual do when they're really attempting to achieve that? And then the flip side of that, what does a 30-year-old do today <laughs> to prepare for even, as you put it, a longer life? You said 120, maybe even 150. Those are great questions. Um, and thanks for asking them. First, let me give a little bit of a perspective, and then I'm going to answer the older couple first, and then, we'll, then, then if you like, we can swing around to the 30-year-old of today. Historically, we've lived a kind of a linear life. First, we learned, did it one time. And then you worked and raised your family, did that once. And then if you live long enough, you had leisure, and then you passed away. I think one of the ideas is if we're going to have a longevity bonus, if we're going to have 5 or 10 or 20 more years of life than our parents did, do we just stick it at the end? Do we do everything in a hurry just to be old longer? And you know what? I don't think that's what people want. I think what people want is to take that extra longevity and distribute it along the way. So what does that mean? It means at the age of 60, instead of saying, I'm in the bottom of the ninth, it's time to just you know pack up the 10 and go to the side of the field, I think people need to think about, am I taking the best care of my body? that I could. And even if you've been overweight or you've been smoking or you've been, you know, neglecting your health, there's still time at 60 to say, okay, I'm going to make myself fit and strong to go the distance. Mm -hmm. And that takes commitment, takes energy, maybe it takes a fitness coach or it takes friends who agree to do that with you. Taking care of your body, really important. Second, I think people today need to think at 60, have I done all that I'll ever do? Or maybe there is more bubbling up inside of me. Mm -hmm. Maybe there's a new career. By the way, the highest level of entrepreneurial success in America in the last decade was people 55 to 64 years old, mm -hmm. which is a shocker because we think when we hear the word entrepreneur, it's all these 25-year-old tech kids from mm -hmm. Silicon Valley. No, it's usually the 60-year-old who's saying, you know, I kind of know a few things now. I've got a little bit of emotional intelligence. I've got some free time. I'm going to start that little consulting company or that... Uh, fishing tackle uh, store, or I'm going to... Well, Ray, Ray Kroc started at... Ray Kroc started at McDonald's when he was 56. Colonel Sanders started at 70-some? Yeah, and after some hardship in his life, yes. after he had a son who passed away and the highway got rerouted so it didn't go by his gas station mm -hmm. anymore. Mm -hmm. There's, uh, you know, Albert Schweitzer was in his 30s or 40s before he decided to become a physician. Gandhi was mm -hmm. uh, kind of a middling politician. Mm -hmm before he found himself in his later years. History is filled with examples of mm -hmm. people 
kind of coming into their stride at 50 mm -hmm. or 60 mm -hmm. or even later. Mm -hmm. And so I think people first have to believe it's possible. And then it's helpful to see some role models. You know, I went to see the Rolling Stones on a recent tour, and you know, the average age is over mm -hmm. 70 now. And I tell you what, they're still pretty good rockers. Mm -hmm. um, to see people at, at an age even beyond yours who are still playing sports, who are still uh, helping out at the church, who are giving to charity, who are going back to college, are very inspirational. And I think it's helpful to have role models. Another thing that uh, people can do uh, if they're turning 60 is to uh, think about can they really afford financially or psychologically to wind it up. Mm. You know, I think in the... What does that mean psychologically? I think in the past, Dr. Corbain, when people thought they'd live 65 or, or 70 years, when you reach 65, you imagine you have five or so years to go, and so maybe it was a good time to relax a bit, have some lemonade, visit the family, and wait for the end. But I'll tell you what, the average 65-year-old today has a 20-year life expectancy. Mm -hmm. So if you're 65, on average, you'll go to 85. Unless you're a woman, in which case it's a bit longer, and unless there's some breakthroughs in the, in the decades to come, in which case you might live longer still. So take a deep breath, like you say to your kids, what do you want to be when you grow up? I think uh, taking some time to maybe go to a community college or read some books or go to the church or, or go to a job fair and get some ideas mm -hmm. about what you could be next. Because our research has found that when people stop, when they stop prematurely, when they give up on growing, on learning, on interacting, especially with younger people, they get old faster, they get sick faster, they render themselves obsolete. And so I think we need to create a culture that helps the couple, like you mentioned, the 60-year-olds, reinvent themselves, mm -hmm. you know, reignite themselves, um, start a new, fresh path. And I think you're going to see more and more of that in the years to come. You have an interesting definition for retirement. You refer, <laughs> I heard in one of your speeches you talk about the definition of retirement. What is that? Well, it's a funny thing because, first of all, it's important to keep in mind before the 20th century, there was no retirement. Didn't exist. Wasn't in the lexicon, wasn't in the dictionaries. People basically worked until they passed away. So if grandpa worked on the farm and he couldn't do the work in the fields, then he'd mend fences. And if he couldn't mend fences, he'd help in the kitchen. And same with grandma. So the idea was that work served three purposes. Uh, number one, it, it gave you some money. Not a bad thing. Number two, it gave you a sense of pride. Mm -hmm. Look at what I did today. Achievement. Exactly. And number three, it brought you in contact with other people. Mm -hmm. Work was social. Mm -hmm. So then the 20th century rolls along, and we invented retirement. And I recently took a look at Webster's Unabridged Dictionary under the definition of retirement, and it's, it's a riot what it says. It says, retirement, to disappear, to go away, to withdraw. So we've somehow created this notion that retirement should be a time of disappearance, mm -hmm. of no longer being involved in the activities of the community, of no longer being a leader, of no longer going to college, no longer trying something new. And I think that definition, it's time for us to put it to, I think it's time we retired that definition of retirement. I think what's emerging is that people are beginning to think of retirement as a time to stay connected, stay engaged. I think college towns are going to become retirement meccas. I think people are going to move back to cities. I think generations will move in together. Mm -hmm. I think people are going to want to stay connected with younger as well as older people because it keeps us current, keeps us fresh. What else? I think people want to learn how to reinvent themselves. What do you do if you've come back from a health problem or you've lost a loved one or a career is wound down? Where do you go in order to reinvent, to reboot yourself using modern jargon? And I think the third thing is that people want to think of their later years of life rather than a time of pure leisure. Leisure's good. I think if you've worked hard having time to go fishing or having time to read books or volunteer, great. But more and more people are saying they want to do something of purpose, mm. maybe even the most important work of their lives. And boy, as a society, we could use the experience, the wisdom, the knowledge that comes with 60 or 70 years of life. And you see that all the time. You see uh, men and women who begin a business, uh, feed it, nurture it, grow it, uh, eventually sell it. Uh, or people who retire, quote-unquote, from a major corporation, and they are financially stable, we'll say. But within months, 
you begin to see this, this uh, uneasiness about, does it matter that I live? I'm not really using my time fully and completely, and I need to be engaged in something. And you see them, if they're serving on, let's say, corporate boards, that has some fulfillment, uh, or they're volunteering in their community and so on. But you know what I, what I find sometimes is that people define their being, their persona, and therefore their importance or their purpose by the work that they do. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? If, if you define yourself as I am because I do this, and if I stop doing this, therefore the I am part will get disrupted. I, um, a few years ago, I was on the lecture circuit, and the speaker before me was Norman Schwarzkopf, who was a great man. And he told a very funny story. Uh, on one day, he was overseeing 500,000 troops, and everything he said was sort of the rule of law, and he was in command. And then he retired, and his wife had bought a home, and he moved to the new home, and he was a little unfamiliar how to be a civilian, and he was loading up the garbage cans. And the garbage can removal people scolded him because he wasn't putting the lid on properly. And he talked about, it's pretty tough to go from being a guy who's got some authority and power <laughs> to being somebody that you can't manage the garbage. Mm. Uh, so what's my point? Uh, I think it's different for women and men. And um, uh, here's how. I think most women have a kind of a multidimensional identity. I've been a mom. I've been a student. I've been a worker. I've been a caregiver to a parent. And so gliding in and out of roles is something that women often do with some fluency, with some ease. It may not always be simple, but they can do that. A lot of men, particularly men uh, over the age of 50, the younger generations will be uh, a more accustomed to changing themselves again and again. But a lot of men define themselves. You say, well, tell me about yourself. Here's what I do. Tell me a little about what matters to you in life. I'm the vice president of, or I ran my own store, or I drove a truck, or they'll define themselves by their job. And then you take that job away, mm -hmm. and they feel empty. You know, vacuum. They feel a vacuum. And for men, learning how to either find a replacement that can feel fulfilling of work, or glide into other roles, being a good grandpa, being a loving community member, being maybe someone who helps other people, a mentor, can be tricky for men. Mm -hmm. And I think we have to learn how to shape shift in a way mm -hmm. as we grow up and grow older. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a phrase in, um, in Africa that when an elder dies, it's like a library burning down. Mm. And I think one of the unfortunate circumstances in our youth-oriented culture is you kind of get to a place in life, you know, you and I are both in our 60s, and hopefully one day we'll be in our 70s and 80s and 90s, you get to a place in life where you kind of know a lot of the answers. But unfortunately, if you check out, there's not going to be many people asking you the questions anymore. Mm -hmm. And so you have to stay connected. You have to stay engaged, mm -hmm. or else you kind of wander off to the sidelines, and that can be a heartache for too many people. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, the healthiest people that we see are living life, living a long life, a healthy life, a stable life, a balanced life, are the ones who tend to redirect, reinvent. So they're not necessarily, they don't get in a rut. They, they tend to read, engage in conversations, dialogue with people. If they watch television, they're watching television that is somehow stimulating to their, to their mind and so on. And, and because of that information and knowledge, they tend to make better decisions in life. Back, back to my question about the young ones. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm intrigued to know, we, we sort of know what the challenge is. We sort of know what might happen and can happen. And you, you, you give a, a pretty optimistic view that life could be fabulous, enjoyable, fulfilling, meaningful, purposeful, and you're going to live a long life. And so, you know, you make the point that if you keep your health and if you make sure financially you are stable and you make sure that you have some purpose in your life, it's not utopia, but it's surely close to it. Let's talk about the young person, younger person, 30-year-old, who's not focused on any of those issues, for whom uh, being 60 years old is eternity from now. Um, what are the two, three, four, or five things that they can do? And the reason I'm asking that question is, you know, when you talk about health, 
We, we say that in, in past generations, people died much younger ages. Yeah. You don't remember the statistics, but I've heard you say them on stage that, that you know, to live to age 40 or 45 is, is remarkable. And yet we talk, it seems like endlessly, about how today we're not really taking good care of our health, what with the food we eat and the lifestyle that we have and the, and the, and the fast-paced life that we have, yet we're, we're living longer. What gives? Well, let me first comment on your last point. Uh, medical science has allowed us to lo live longer, but I'm not sure we're living all that better, especially in later years. Mm. It, I, I once heard it said that if you took 175-year-olds from a century ago and took 100 average 75-year-olds of now and had them compete like in, Olymp in Olympics, obviously you can't do that, but if you could, the ones from a century ago would beat the ones from today. Mm. Because in the old days, you got sick, you died. Mm. So people who are hardy enough to make it to 75 or 80 were pretty tough mm. cookies. Today we have a lot of older people with debilities and arthritis and dementia and heart disease and with cardiac cripples. And so we're keeping people alive longer, but not necessarily healthy. But let me... Le uh, keeping them alive with, with medications and procedures and the like. Right, and that's a good thing. I mean, I think, uh, you know, we're not to stop that. Mm -hmm. But let me go back to the question about if I were to give advice to a 30-year-old from having studied aging, mm -hmm. you might mm -hmm. say, well, what's the relevance? First, let me, let me be candid and say that I've got a 24-year-old and a 27-year-old, so I can relate to this a little bit with my own kids, and they're great kids. Um, I'd give a few pieces of advice. Um, first of all, plan to live a long life. Uh, the young generation, due to some breakthroughs that are around the corner, may very well live 100 or 150 or even 200 mm -hmm. years. And I know that sounds completely zany, but if you went back to the beginning of the 20th century, living 75 or 80 years would have thought of, people would have thought mm -hmm. that's only for the rare few. It's not that zany, I'll tell you why. One, one of my good friends who has spoken at High Point University mm -hmm. on more than one occasion is Dr. Tony Atala, who is known worldwide for his the regenerative Medicine. disease mm -hmm. uh, 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 clinics and, and practice. And he bespeaks very much, he, he um, underscores what you've just said, that, that the day will come when our body will be able to recreate certain organs and, and medicine can help in this way and so on. So, so living to 100, 120, et cetera, is, is documented that people believe We that. may not get there, but our kids, good chance. And you know, there's mm -hmm. some new players. You know, Google mm -hmm. just launched a company called Calico that's specific focus is to stop the aging process. Mm. Craig Ventner, who, uh, who's the guy that decoded DNA, has just started a company, Longevity Inc., uh, and he's going to try to see if he can change the whole way in which our bodies grow old. Mm. There's all sorts of new players, creative, mm. inventive minds mm. who, are, who are focusing on this project, project, maybe because they're worried about getting old themselves. Mm. All right, so the first thing I'd say to people, young people, is you may live a very long life. Think of a 100 or 150-year horizon. Mm. The second thing I'll say is don't be so focused on which career you're going to pick mm. because you'll probably have five. You might even have 10. And so what will be more important than any particular career is the ability to learn and to learn again and again and again. The capacity to be a student, the capacity to learn something new, whether it's new technology or a new field of study or how to live in another part of the world. Mm. People who get all rigid and are unwilling to learn are the ones that get trapped in the past. Mm. The third thing I'd say is uh, save, save. The aging of the boomers is gonna put a lot of pressure on the younger generations. Mm. And um, it's hard to know what, how many of the entitlements will still be in place 20, 30, 40 years from now. So be wise about your money. Put money aside. Build your own nest egg. Make sure you're spending some for today and you're putting some aside for tomorrow. Mm -hmm. uh, the next thing I'll say is um, try to envision a life of purpose. I've got two more. This is the next mm -hmm. to last one. Um, that just doing something because it's cool or it's showy, not every job is fun every mm. single day, mm. but when, you, when I've talked to people who have looked back over their long lives, the ones who are the most proud, who feel the most full, are ones who feel that they made decisions along the way mm. that were serving a higher purpose. Now whether that's religious or whether that's just maximizing your human potential or, uh, or being a kinder person, being a giving person, 
people look back on their lives and they measure themselves. And so that's a good thing to keep in mind when you're young. Young people are very taken by the game of life. They like to have mentors. And so mm -hmm. having an idea as to how you're going to measure yourself towards the end can help you make decisions along the way. Mm -hmm. And the last thing I'll say is, and this is a wild thing, Dr. Corbain, we've done research now all over the world with mm -hmm. elders. And we've asked them, what's the most important ingredient in living a satisfying long life? And it doesn't matter what country you're in, it doesn't matter who you're asking, the same answer comes back. People say, it's the people you love and the people who love you. Mm -hmm. We think it's the big car, we think it's the big house, we think it's the fancy title. At the end of the day, people say, living a life of connection with others, living a life where you're loving others and they're being kind mm -hmm. and loving you back is the most important ingredient. And I would tell 30-year-olds that, absolutely. Yeah. It's faith, family and friends, it's not fans, fortune and such. Well. I think you know this, at Hype University, I teach a freshman class. All the freshmen take a uh, life skills class with me. And then the seniors, before they graduate, they take another class with me. In those classes, I emphasize some very important points, some fundamentals, some cornerstones for success. And one of them is that research suggests that when you graduate from college, it is likely that you would have as many as 30, 40, 45 different jobs. Wow, in your that career. many. Now, jobs, not necessarily careers. Okay. A job could be in the same company, in the same organization. Fair enough. But the point is that technology is changing the world. Market demands are changing our expectations of what could happen. Uh, the fact that we compete on a global platform today instead of a continental one. All these factors bring to the discussion, to the table, all kinds of impactful elements that we cannot really predict with any accuracy. We say we want to prepare our students for the world as it's going to be, not as the world as it is today or as it was, and yet we don't know precisely how the world is going to be. That's why you're a fascinating interview, because you're talking to us about the notion that the world is going to be could be fantastic if you, if you prepare yourself and plan yourself for it. So, so we say to these students, in the no, if you accept the notion that you're going to uh, change positions so many times and jobs so many times, please know that there is one common ingredient you must have if you're going to survive. And you've said it in so many words. We call it the entrepreneurial spirit. And that doesn't mean you have to be an entrepreneur. You don't functionally have to go open a company. But you have to have the mindset for it. And the entrepreneurial spirit suggests that you're nimble, that you're flexible, that you believe that school is never out for the pro. For, for the uh, school is never out for the, yes, for the pro. And that, and that you understand that you have to be in a continuum of learning not necessarily formal learning, but that you have to feed your mind. You know, garbage in, garbage stays, wisdom in, wisdom stays. And we teach those lessons. Who you spend time with is who you become. What you choose is what you get. It's exactly what you've said to me in the last 30 minutes. You've really said that our choices, you, you, you've categorized them in health and purpose and finance, mm -hmm. but our choices determine not just our success, but our significance in life. Can I ask you a question? Right now, much of our educational system is geared to people in their early decades of life to help prepare them for a career and to get them going. Mm. Can you envision a future filled with 50 and 60 and 80 and 90 and 100 year olds where education will truly be lifelong? Oh, I can. I, th I think some of that future is here today. I mean, I mean, it's what you and I do. You and I literally carry the classroom We've done it for 35 years mm -hmm. to the platforms of the world, right? Isn't that what yes. we do? Yes, When we true. go speak at companies, conventions, associations, whatever the case might be, we're taking our content, our educational content, and just taking it to where they are. And if people didn't want to learn, you and I would have been out of work a long time ago. And so I think, I think that there's an acceptance of that. Maybe what we don't have and maybe what I don't envision with clarity is how you deliver that, how you assemble them, how you, how you execute on it in ways that meet the demands of today's society and in ways that are fiscally feasible to, to create those demands. In other words, the ROI, the return on investment, has to be there with, with some sense. At Hyper University, we are talking seriously about having um, 
it's a simple idea, summer camps for families mm. where, where dads and moms and the college age kids will come here, stay, and we have fabulous facilities, student facilities that are maybe available in the summer. And then we can have conferences where people can learn, where they can go to classes, where they can, where they can and not just learn the discipline as in a college degree, but about life itself, just the points you've talked about. How do you redirect your life? How do you find purpose? College campus is filled with great minds like yours, right? They're the great people who are learned in their fields. So we're talking about this already. It's tough to execute on something when it is not as easily definable. And when it is maybe not an outlier, but slightly outside the parameters with which you traditionally have done what you've done. That's where I think higher education is, is being challenged in a big way. And the future could be very rewarding if we and when we heed more of what you're talking about. I took note uh, last year, Google, which is a company that every young kid wants, seems to want to work for, last year they got three million unsolicited job applicants. Mm -hmm. Three million people <laughs> sent in applications to work at Google. But Google had to hire somebody who would be head of innovative technology. And so they could have hired any young, brilliant, wizard, genius, 12-year-old, 20-year-old, 30-year-old. And instead, they hired a 66-year-old, Ray Kurzweil. Why? Because they thought he could do the job, get the job done. So let me ask you a question. You've had enormous success in your life. Yours is a life almost out of a fable, a storybook. And so you passed your 60s, your 60th birthday a few years ago. And instead of going off to the sidelines and playing golf or kicking back and enjoying your successes, you rolled up your sleeves and took on this new challenge, this extraordinary university, which has gone through more growth and more uh, mind-boggling transformations in the last few years than any university I'm aware of. Why at this stage in life? And does it, do you ever ask yourself, am I too old for this? Mm. Well, first of all, you're very kind to say that. I appreciate your, your um, words and your um, comments very much. Um, I came to High Point when I was actually 56. A kid. Uh, uh, yeah, a kid, <laughs> yeah, by your definition. <laughs> and all the graphs you show, definitely a kid. Um, and I did it because I was invited to do it. I evaluated the, the opportunity. And I faithfully and courageously concluded that I could bring something to an institution of higher learning like High Point and bring forth all the learning, just what you've said about the Google guy, all the learning of a mass in a lifetime in, in, in multidisciplinary, uh, from multidisciplinary perspectives, and um, respect the protocol of the university on the one hand, we'll call that the Mona Lisa, but build a frame around the Mona Lisa that dares to be innovative, not just creative, not just doing things differently, but doing them better, that dares to say that we don't want to weed students out of the system, we want to weave them into the family, that dares to say education has got to be more than information and knowledge, it has to be holistic. You have to prepare an individual, you know, mentally, but spiritually and socially and psychologically for a life that is demanding and will command of them their very best. And I really believed somehow that I could say to people, you know, when God breathed in your nostrils and gave you life, God intended for you to be extraordinary. So, hey, choose to be extraordinary because the alternative to that is to be ordinary. And I don't know if I believed it in an innocent way. I don't know whether I believed it because cumulatively in my life, you know, I've crossed those paths and they proved to be successful. But I came here with an open mind. And you know what I found? I found an amazingly receptive environment. You know, people think of a university as set in their own way, and faculty are difficult. It's not true. If you, if you are clear with your message, and if you can depict and articulate a vision that people can see benefit for them and possibilities for them to perform and be partners with you, uh, they step up and step out to make things happen. That's what we've done here. So, you know, why did I do it? Because I believe everything I've read in your books. I believe that... I'm going to live a long time. I believe that I'm very healthy, very energetic. Um, and just to follow your, your points, healthy, 
financially able to sidestep and do something that, that you believe can be helpful to society and to young people. And thirdly, it is where purpose lies. You know, why are we alive and what difference does it make? And, and um, I, I say every day on our campus, we have only one focus, to plant seeds of greatness in the minds, of course, but also in the hearts and the souls of our futures. And parents responded in ways I could have never imagined. Parents from everywhere said, we're looking for a school like this. You mean you really teach them? We said, no, we don't teach them. We enable them to learn. We don't lecture them. We simply model the values. They watch and they learn. And so I have to tell you, my friend, it's the best chapter of my life. And mm -hmm. you've known me a long time and you've known many of the chapters of my life. It's the best chapter of my life. Not financially. <laughs> Not necessarily financially, again, to your point, but spiritually and emotionally and in a sense, and purposefully. And so that's why what you say is so important. That's why when I hear you speak, I don't care if you're speaking to, to professionals or you're speaking to, to uh, a society of, of uh, you know, uh, a certain trade uh, society or, or if they're academics or if they are politicians, your message absolutely makes sense because what you say is there is more to life and we can get it and we can achieve it if we would follow these steps, if we would have a, an open mind and a hopeful heart. And I believe that's a message we all need. We can't get up tomorrow morning and be worried about our sickness. We have to get up tomorrow morning and say, let me focus on my wellness and how can I turn that into measurable results for so many people. So let me, you, you asked me that question and I gave you an honest answer. Yes, you did. Why are you still working? And why, have you written 16 books <laughs> and you're working on another book? Why, have you built a big library in your house? You have empty shelves? What exactly is it you're trying to do? Boy, don't I wish I knew that, but, uh, but let me try to answer. I, um, I was asked the other night, would I like to be young again? And I gave a, first I gave sort of a wise guy answer. I said, for a couple of weekends, you know, <laughs> I wish I could feel the body, my body again at 25 um, instead of my body at 64. But I wouldn't want to be young again. Mm. I feel like I've learned so much. I have such a deep love for my wife. Mm. So happy to have my children. Um, I've got powers now. I never had when I was young. Mm. I watch the young kids today trying to make something themselves and not knowing how to get a job or not knowing how to make decisions and hoping they'll fall in love. And I mean, my heart goes to mm. young people. It's such a complicated world today to try to figure out, am I going to be okay? <clears throat> I don't want to go through that again. I hope that I can keep my health. I've been lucky in life. I've earned enough money where um, my wife and I are pretty financially secure. I've worked very hard. I'm one of these maniacal, mm -hmm. crazy workaholic guys. I've worked very hard. I grew up poor, lower middle class, nothing. I had nothing. Nothing came to me easy. I wasn't handed anything down. Uh, I've worked hard. I believe in hard work. Uh, and by the way, I've got a couple of friends who are very wealthy, and they're planning on laying off on their children huge sums of money. And I'm trying to talk them out of it. Mm. I think that one of the great satisfactions in life is trying really hard mm -hmm. and making something. Mm -hmm. You don't have to become Warren Buffett or mm -hmm. Donald Trump. I mean, I don't mm -hmm. know who wants to be Donald Trump, but you don't have to be anybody else. But I think working hard and making something of yourself and mm -hmm. feeling I gave it my best shot. I used to like Alan Iverson, the basketball player, because he'd always say, I left everything on the court. I gave it all to the, to the game. <clears throat> and I feel the same about work. I feel that um, I want to give it all. I want to give everything I've got. I will tell you that as I've grown older, to my surprise, people take me more seriously. I didn't expect that. Mm. Um, I've just been asked to be the chairman-elect of the largest professional association of people who work in the field of aging. So I'm going to be helping to set the framework for the entire field. Uh, I've been asked to sit on boards and advisory committees. I'm involved with uh, a group of people who are attempting to wipe out Alzheimer's disease. And I find that I can make a phone call 
and I get a phone call back mm. that as I've gotten older, uh, my influence seems to have multiplied. Mm. And I go through a little bit of a back and forth with myself. I don't know if you feel the same. Part mm. of me feels like, aren't I supposed to be kind of winding down mm. and smelling the roses and just, you know, kicking it? Mm. I'd like to have more time off. I think of it in terms of a, like my life portfolio. I want more time off, and I'm doing more and more things for no pay. Mm -hmm. There are charities, there are organizations, mm -hmm. there are causes that I believe in, mm -hmm. and I want to mm -hmm. put myself into that wholeheartedly. Mm -hmm. But I don't, I don't feel that I want to be a nobody. I don't mm -hmm. feel like I want to give it up. I don't feel like I want to just stop. In fact, I love to feel, you know, if things work out, then I have more years left in my life, uh, that I can continue to make an impact, that I can build my legacy, mm -hmm. that I can do my best work in the years to come, that I can even be smarter. I, I, I was interviewing a person the other day who runs a care coordination company, and he told me he's only looking to hire people over 50, he's not looking to hire any young people. Mm -hmm. And I said, why is that? He said, because young people, they might have tons of energy, but they've got really no life experience mm -hmm. yet to help solve people's life problems, to be a caregiver. You need some emotional intelligence. You need to be around the block a few times. You need to get up and get knocked down a few times. And at this point in my life, I feel like I've, I've reached more of that than I had when I was a younger man. So while I'd like to keep my health and my vitality, and I notice I don't bounce as easily as I used to when I travel and I work, I get a little more tired, but I feel that I've got so many things I want to do. I mean, there's so many problems I'd like to help solve. There are so many ideas I'd like to generate, so many other books I'd like to write. I've got a science fiction screenplay I'd like to do. I've got a Broadway show I'd like to bring about. I've got, uh, I mean, I just got my list seems to grow as I get older of all the things I still want to do. So that's how I think of it. Mm -hmm. Well, and you have so much to say, and you help people when you say it. And so you have a body of knowledge that's, that's uh, accumulating, and you're able to become more interpretive with this body of knowledge and helping so many people. I heard you say one time, um, I don't remember the person that you were quoting, but something about, and I'm paraphrasing, but something about just because I am 77 years old does not mean I don't have any dreams anymore. I'll tell you exactly the story, um, and it's one of my favorite moments. When John Glenn, Senator Glenn, announced he was going back up into space at 77, mm -hmm. I was asked by CNN to provide commentary about this because it was kind of a kooky thing to do. I mean, here's a guy, 77, going up into space. And, you know, space is not an easy thing. And it's tough on the body. Uh, who knows what's going to happen? Mm -hmm. So I watched his first interviews, and I know Glenn. He's a very tough guy. And I watched the first couple of hours of interviews, and there were a lot of young reporters, and they were saying things like, you know, don't you think you're too old for this? And what happens if your head blows up? What happens if your heart gives out? And don't you think you ought to just be mowing the lawn? And, and Glenn turned to these reporters full on, and he said, hey, just because I'll be 77 doesn't mean I still don't have dreams. Mm. Mm. And I heard that, and I thought, Wow, I think we think that our kids have hopes and dreams. Mm -hmm. Or maybe we once did, and we either lived them out or they didn't work out, and now it's time to sort of go off to the play field of old age. But what Glenn was saying was, if we're going to live a longer life, maybe it's 60, maybe it's 70, maybe it's 77 or later, there are still more dreams, dreams to play the piano, Dreams to write a book of poems, mm. even if nobody reads it. Dreams to figure out your purpose in life. Dreams to build a church. Dreams to travel around the world. Dreams to learn how to sail a sailboat. That I think if we're going to live a long life, we have to get out of the notion that dreaming and visioning is only the province of the young. I think we have to give more breath and more roadway to the idea of people in their second half of life having new dreams, mm -hmm. new hopes. And that means that the 22-year-old, when mom comes home and says, I'm dreaming of going to law school, or I'm going to be a tap dancer, or oh, I think I'm going to do is start a new charity and change the world, that we've got to give our parents the freedom to redream, mm -hmm. to reboot themselves, to reimagine their own futures, and go off and do it. Mm -hmm. Speaking of uh, uh, influential people you met, 
or influencing people you've met? Um, you just mentioned one. You've traveled the world. You've gone to a lot of countries. You're a fellow of the... Uh, I've been a fellow of the World Economic World Forum. World Economic Forum. Uh, you've met through that and other places, lots of people. Name us one or two people you've met who had an indelible, who made an indelible impression on you, and tell us why. Well, first let me say, and you and I have something we, we share in common. I'm not sure all your viewers will know this, but in addition to our businesses and to our think tanks and to your university and to my research company, uh, we've been public speakers. Mm -hmm. And um, first, I can't imagine in this modern age uh, how anybody can get anything done without being an effective communicator. And, uh, and, and as some people know, you were one of my teachers, my mentors when I was in my 20s when you were when you were starting out as a young man yourself. So one of the things that happens when you're a public speaker is you get asked to speak. Mm -hmm. And before you know it, you're in front of audiences and you meet interesting people and they've got opinions and they ask you questions and you don't know the answer, but then you try to find the answer. And even if you don't know what you're talking about, in time, you learn because being a public speaker gives you a gravitational field mm -hmm. to meet all sorts of folks. Mm -hmm. My topic, the age wave, the global aging, is an odd topic. And so there's not that many people in my field. Mm -hmm. So along the way, I've met five presidents and probably half the Fortune 500 and many, many world leaders from Tony Blair to Nelson Mandela. And um, I've had the privilege of my career offering me access to some of the world's most extraordinary people, whether it's Steve Jobs or Jack Welsh or all sorts of amazing people. But to answer your question, who's made indelible impressions on me? Um, uh, first and foremost, I'd have to say my wife. <laughs> uh, just because she's amazing. Um, and she's I, involved in the business with yes, you. Yes, we've been married uh, 30 years. Mm -hmm. I would also tell you we've been married 31 times. Mm -hmm. Each year my wife and I get remarried on our anniversary. It's expensive. In a different location with a different religion. Doesn't have to be expensive. Sometimes <laughs> okay. we just get a minister or a justice of the peace or... We've been married all over the world in crazy places. <laughs> uh, my most influential figure in my life is my wife. I I'm a lucky man. I've got a wife who's got street smarts and mm -hmm. smacks me in the head if I get carried away with myself. And uh, has been a great mom to our kids. Um, probably the most extraordinary human being I've ever been in the presence of was Nelson Mandela. Um, I met him in Switzerland. I've just never met a being who was so beautiful so tall, so erect, so powerful, yet so modest. Mm. This strange juxtaposition of a charisma that's almost bristling with profound modesty. Never experienced anything like that. I work with, um, I work with President Carter on his uh, Virtues of Aging book. He asked me to help him figure that subject out. And uh, separate from how he did or didn't do as president, um, Here's a man who reinvented himself, who attempted to become a great author, a thinker, a philosopher, uh, a world figure in his post-career. I'm taken by Bill Clinton. Um, I've been on lots of programs with uh, President Clinton. Uh, you know, he's sort of a cross between John F. Kennedy and Elvis, you know. I've never really <laughs> seen anybody quite like this man. He just fills a room with his charisma, with his energy, with his intelligence with his creativity. Um, I was taken by my meeting with Ronald Reagan. Um, I asked Ronald Reagan a question. I was with him on his 79th birthday. I said to Mr. President, as a long-lived American and as a leader of Americans, I wonder if you've come to a perspective as to what makes us special. So I think he might have been 79 at the time. And he said to me, you know, he does that kind of well. He said to me, as Ronald Reagan would do, um, he said, Ken, if you and your wife moved to Japan and learned the language and spent the rest of your life there, you'd never be considered Japanese. If you fell in love with France and loved the food and loved the wine and lived there forever, you'd never be considered a Frenchman. Same if you moved to Brazil. You'd never be a Brazilian. But people come to our country from mm. all over the world, from every background, and become Americans. Wow. And I thought, wow. That's powerful. What a, 
what a brilliant insight. You know, mm. the most patriotic but mm. clean, not political party patriotic. Mm. So those are some of my most extraordinary people. I personally was touched by Maggie Kuhn, mm. the founder of the Grey Panthers. Buckminster Fuller was one of my mentors. The geodesic dome mm. kind of innovator was a man that had a big impression on me. In the aging field, Dr. Robert Butler was a gentleman and a scholar and a brilliant uh, man. And um, I've had the good fortune, as I know you have also, of meeting so many interesting people, some mm. famous, some not so famous, mm. some just good-hearted, kind-hearted people. I interviewed Houston Smith recently, who's a 92-year-old religious scholar, uh, and he's very much at the end of his life. And I asked him, if there's one lesson you've learned from studying all the world's religions and also living over 90 years, what lesson would you teach me? And he looked at me, and he said, be a little kinder. So I've had the good fortune of having many teachers and um, have learned interesting things from so mm -hmm. many of them. And many, many people would say that about you because you have influenced the lives of many through your writings, through your lectures. You have spoken literally to millions of people. Uh, you have uh, opened up our eyes to the notion that the future could indeed be bright and promising. Uh, you've encouraged us to think of ourselves as beings who can develop and evolve and it's never too late, and uh, through, uh, through our connectiveness and through our relationships, we can build bridges to make this world a better place. Dr. Kent Deitwald, I thank you very much for being with us today and being on the campus of High Point University. Such and I wish for, for you and your work always great success because I know you create great significance wherever you go. Thank you so much. Thank Dr. you very much. Pleasure to be with you. Quality Public Television is made possible through the financial contributions of viewers like you, who invite you to join them in supporting UNC-TV.